Well, delegates, uh, thanks for joining us for the afternoon session. Uh, we hope you've enjoyed this morning's session. It's uh, been quite captivating the discussions up till now and it will no doubt continue. And this uh, with our next guest, Richard Alston. Um, since leaving federal politics after almost 18 years, uh, Richard Olson had previously served as Minister for Communications, Information, Technology and the Arts, and has actually carved out a varied and extensive career in the commercial sector since leaving office. He has served on many boards, both public and private, and has been chairman of three Australian public companies. For more than six years, he served as a director of a listed UK public company and was a member of the international board of one of the world's largest hedge funds. He, of course, was Australian High Commissioner to the United Kingdom 2005 to 2008. He's currently Chairman of Sunny Ridge, Australia's largest strawberry farm, and has just told us that he's back jogging three times a week. And I think it's important for me to show you uh, Richard's book and obviously asking that question, more to life than politics. So we may come back to that in the question and answer session. But Richard, the screen is yours. Um you mentioned uh, my time in London, and I can remember at the time I got an invitation from one of the leading investment banks to come along to a breakfast with Henry Kissinger to deliver a, a major speech. And I started wondering to myself how much they'd have to pay the guy to come across the Atlantic. And my mind went back a couple of years earlier to a conference I'd spoken at in Norway, sponsored by Cisco, and the keynote speaker there was Al Gore. And after saying a few words, he managed to disappear before lunch. And the organizers were very put out and they told me that they paid him 250,000 US, and that's 15 years ago. So I thought, God, how much is Henry gonna get for this effort? I'm sure he'll put on a major performance and there'll be a lot in the structure of the speech that I can learn from. So imagine my surprise when he stood up and he said, look, I'm sure, most of you here have read all my books and speeches, so I think I'll just take questions. And I thought, well, that's that's a good way to get it. If you can get away with it, it's good work. <laughs> but anyway, I don't propose to go down that path, but I'm happy to take questions later. In the meantime, what I'd like to do is give you a, a short history of some of the highlights in the portfolio. And I was in opposition and government with communications for nearly 12 years. And in many respects, my time mirrored the rise of the information technology revolution. So first, some political context. Even good governments run out of time. I think we, we could say that about the Howard government, uh, usually for reasons other than policy. Hawke ultimately got thrown out by his own side because he'd welched on the Kirribilli handover deal with Keating, who wasn't prepared to wait any longer. And by the time Keating got there, he was pretty much past his prime. But he had been a trained political killer, but more importantly, he was a serious policy reformer. And in the area of comms, he was keen to privatise Telstra, or at least sell off everything except the union controlled network. Ultimately, uh, Kim Beasley and the unions rolled him. So when I first became shadow minister for comms in 1989, the portfolio was all about media and the perennial Packer versus Murdoch battles telecommunications industry was a policy backwater. But as I soon discovered, this was an industry sector that was about to explode and I was there at the dawn of creation. Breakthrough technologies were emerging, such as fibre optics, which enabled 100,000 simultaneous voice calls to be transmitted over a single fibre thinner than a human hair. But telecoms was simply a public sector infrastructure private fiefdom run by engineers, a gold-plated network for which they charge whatever they like. It was also dominated by 95,000 employees in 22 unions, both blue and white collar, and they're all more than content with the status quo. Following the seminal 1993 Hilmer review in, on competition policy, Labor had tiptoed into corporatisation, but any suggestion of serious competition, let alone privatisation, was met with the lazy and self-interested assertion that telephony was a natural monopoly. However, it was a port the portfolio of my dreams because I'd completed an MBA with my major thesis on the universal service obligation of Telstra, as it was known then until telecom, until, which it was until 1995. 
As a matter of interest, my key lecturer was Henry Ergas and my course supervisor, Alan Feld. I could see very interesting pitfalls, uh, policy battles ahead, but the path uh, was not necessarily easy. When I had the temerity to suggest that telecom might have a conflict of interest by having a seat on the board of its competitor, OSAT, in which it held a 25% stake, I promptly received a very nasty and legally threatening letter from the managing director. As we were fast approaching the 1990 election, I decided that discretion was the better part of valour and I held my tongue. However, I was able to return fire shortly afterwards at a major conference where I took the opportunity to describe the company as Australia's largest sheltered workshop. Naturally, I received a complaint from the relevant charity, but the real squeal came when I was attending a Telstra function in Parliament House. The then MD Mel Ward sidled up to me and said, Richard, I strongly advise you not to use that term again. We have about 90,000 employees, they all have families, and none of them will vote for you. I thanked him politely for his concern, but a few minutes later, Ros Kelly, who was the junior minister for communications, came up to pass on the same message. By now, I smelled a large rat, but it was only when I returned to my room that the penny dropped. This was hurting them politically. Next thing the phone rang, it was the legendary Peter Harvey, National Nine News. He wanted to know if he could come and do a quick interview. It won't take long, he said, I just need you to repeat that phrase, Australia's largest childhood workshop a couple of times. I duly complied and sure enough, it led the Laurie Oates program the following Sunday morning. When we came to office in 1996, there was very limited competition in telecoms, no government support for the regions, virtually no consumer safeguards, and Telstra was of course in full public ownership. Privatisation was generally a difficult sell to the public. I'm sure you all remember Harold Macmillan's line about selling off the family silver. Labor had privatised everything that moved when they were in government, including the Commonwealth Bank and Qantas, although they denied intending to do so in the lead up to the 1993 election. But I think all governments came to realise that it was an irresistible win-win in terms of competition, efficiency, and most importantly, vast amounts of revenue. John Howard's genius was to use the proceeds of sale of Telstra to fund a new $1 billion natural heritage trust, an environment mega package, which, was large, which largely neutralised the green lobby in the lead up to the election. One of my first actions in government was to convene an all day meeting at the Sydney Maritime Museum attended by more than 200 stakeholders in the telecoms industry to work through the competition reform bill, which had already been introduced by Labor. I personally chaired the meeting and conducted a careful line by line examination of all the major concepts. The event was very successful, not only in crafting a workable scheme, but also demonstrating our willingness to go down into the trenches to drive reforms. The information economy was hardly acknowledged, let alone seen as a priority, while the internet was only for academics and geeks. Over the next eight years, the telecommunications landscape was deregulated and transformed. Our major achievements included full and open competition, two parcel sales of Telstra, world-class consumer safeguards, record funding for regional services, guaranteed minimum internet speeds, effective regulation of the internet and e-commerce, a fully funded national broadband strategy, world leading spectrum planning and auctions, the introduction of digital TV, additional targeted funding for the ABC, a massive extension of SBS TV, fixing up over 200 TV black spots, a permanent regime for community TV, world's best practice venture capital reforms, and a new National Information and Communications Technology Centre of Excellence. It was all underpinned by backing Australia's ability, which was a $3 billion strategy to foster science and innovation, and I was heavily involved in that. Um, so innovation and productivity growth in Australia was surging in the 1990s, in large part due to the impact of ICT, which was triggering tectonic changes in consumer and business behaviour. But the quality of service obligations on Telstra were virtually non-existent. Consumers could wait for up to 27 months for a telephone connection with no access to compensation if comp connection or, or fault repair times were not met. 
Telstra was always a difficult player as it controlled nearly all the data and critical information. Although my, my task was made somewhat easier when Ziggy Switkowski replaced Frank Blunt as CEO. Lack of concern for customers reached a zenith in the long running dispute and ultimately in this litigation between Telstra and COTS, casualties of Telstra, basically a lot of small businesses. Uh, thanks to Ziggy Switkowski, uh, he agreed to pay them out uh, straight away and I think that was a, a very smart move. One of the uh, key roles that I had to play in privatising Telstra was to entice Senators Harradine and Colston, the two independents whose votes would decide the fate of a bill, into our tent. They were both ex-Labor, but for very different reasons. Harradine was the high, of the highest integrity, Colston a very different kettle of fish. One of Brian Harradine's particular gripes was that Telstra officially treated the island of Tasmania as the Southern Victorian region. The then CEO Frank Blunt was reluctant to get close to the political culture, tending to be very dismissive of government. He said, why should I have to accommodate a two-bit senator from Tasmania? My reply was, Frank, if you really want Telstra to be privatised, you do. And he did. One of the biggest issues in the early days, at least, was the rollout of hybrid fibre coaxial cable to replace the traditional copper network. Telstra adopted the purely defensive strategy of simply matching the Optus rollout, which ended in a scoreless draw with only Melbourne, Sydney and Brisbane being substantially covered. A real political issue erupted with Optus rolling out overhead cables, much quicker and cheaper, but soon regarded as dangerous and unsightly. Even my local council, Burundara, obtained an injunction to prohibit them. Tony Abbott um, proposed a, a multi-billion dollar fund uh, package to help fund laying underground cables in certain areas where you decided that was a, a bit much to, to spend. I, I found it very ironic when I was in London a few years later to find that they'd had a similar furor over the same issue, but there it was quite the opposite. They wanted all the cables underground. The, the information economy was very much until soil, an inherited policy wasteland. wasteland. 18 months into government, I got formal responsibility for it. Another great policy bonus for me, because in many ways, the future of development of technologies and the policy implications were becoming hugely important to all economies. For me, it was the best game in town with regular visits to Silicon Valley. We established NOE, the National Office for the Information Economy, and IPAC, the Information Policy Advisory Council, both of which became very active. And we also put in place a high powered broadband advisory group, which had a number of international experts on board. We're also fortunate to have a telecoms advisor who specialized in devising meaningful acronyms by the name of Paul Fletcher. This included TIGERS, which I'll come to later, BITS, which was building on IT strengths, BARN, building additional rural networks. Eventually, someone in my office sent a note around saying, please, no more TLAs, which I'm sure you know stands for no, three-letter acronyms. These initiatives were particularly relevant in our rollout to regional and rural areas, where we ultimately spent over $1 billion in the proceeds of sale of Telstra. The initial one-third sale in November 1997 was accompanied by a $250 million infrastructure fund which was distributed on the basis of the percentage of the population in each state residing outside the capital cities. It just happened that this was particularly advantageous to the home states of Senators Harrodine and Colston, who represented the two most decentralised states in the Commonwealth. From the outset, we recognised that Tasmania as a long time indigenous, in, indigent state had been neglected for too long. Accordingly, the second tranche was accompanied by $40 million for TIGERS, which stands for Trials and Government Electronic Services, a long system broadband project, funding for infrastructure for remote islands such as King and Flinders Island, and funding to help Tasmanian schools go online. My colleagues started saying that if Tassie received any more funding for telecommunications infrastructure, it would sink, but nonetheless. The privatisation of Telstra was a daily news event. The media couldn't get enough of it. 
I was amazed in London to find that it was never, ever an issue. However, in Australia, the, the Labor government, which had been a big fan of privatisation, decided in opposition that they were staunchly opposed. So it was always going to be tight. In early 98, we announced the decision to sell the remaining two thirds. The run up to the vote on T2 was crucial as we needed to get both independents on board. Colston had been long under a cloud for allegedly rorting travel expenses. And eventually the Labor Party targeted John Howard for taking Colston's tainted vote, although Labor itself had no qualms about doing so. The media was happy to run with the Labor line of attack, so eventually we referred the allegations to the federal police and thereafter declined to accept his vote. This was a very honourable decision by the PM, but it later had seriously deleterious consequences as Colston ultimately voted T2 down. The government then announced a staged approach to the further sale, selling only 16%, leaving the balance in government hands with any further sale to be subject to an independent inquiry into Telstra's customer service levels in metropolitan, regional, rural and remote areas. The, the inquiry in due course gave us a tick and we responded with a $163 million package focused on improving mobile coverage, internet speeds and better use of, of telecoms in the health and education sectors. In the lead up to the, 19, to the 2001 election, we had a lot of fun with the ALP alternative, which you may recall was christened Noodle Nation, a Barry Jones special. But once we were back in government, we held a further inquiry following which we committed another 181 million to further rural improvements. By this time, I thought we were winning the battle. I fondly remember going out to Condamine in the Western Downs region of Queensland to launch a new mobile phone base station where I was presented with a Condamine Cods Guernsey. It was a very small hall, but there were some, some hundreds of people crowded into it. So I thought this, this could be interesting. So I made a little speech and at the end of it, uh, the mayor said, well, anyone got any questions? And there's deathly silence. And finally this bloke said, yeah, he said, I got a problem. He said, I rode into town today on me horse and me bloody phone went off. And he said, frighten the shit out of the horse. When are you bastards going to do something about a ring friendly, horse friendly ringtone? So I thought to myself, well, if that's the biggest issue they have, we're on a winner. And that's how it turned out. I think in the bush, we ultimately rolled out uh, an amazing array of uh, services and I have to pay special tribute to my colleagues in the National Party because the Liberal Party actually held more seats in the bush than, than the Nats, but we were close partners and um, war never really broke out. And people like Ron Boswell, who were, was more of a warrior than anyone else, uh, became very good friends with me and he was a tower of strength in identifying both problems and solutions. We appointed Doug Anthony to chair a regional telecommunications infrastructure fund. John Fay as finance minister was a pleasure to work with, as was John Anderson, one of the finest people I've ever met. Another great supporter was Tim Fisher, not just because we'd been to the same school, but as minister for trade, he, not, he would regularly ring me up and keep me posted on how he was selling our technology developments to the rest of the world. And he had a unique story about mixed whips out of Darwin. So by the time I decided with some encouragement from my wife to retire gracefully, the numbers were in. By 1 July 2003, the ACCC found that fixed line and mobile prices had fallen by about 25%, local and long distance by 30%, international over 60. The Allen Consulting Group found that Telco competition had led to consumer benefits of approximately $750 per household and GDP had grown by about 10 billion with an additional 100,000 jobs. And Telco services to the bush had been transformed. We had achieved in the title of the 1997 book on the telecoms revolution, which I had read several times, The Death of Distance. Thank you, Andrew. I wanted to just explore um, in the time remaining uh, with you is that at the front of your book, you talk about your attendance at, at a Jesuit school and you had an interest in the developing world uh, ahead of getting into politics. And then, um, you know, you, you say that you're drawn to politics as the main place uh, 
to achieve permanent and effective change. In what ways did your philosophical beliefs shape some of these important decisions, some of the reform agenda that you were part of? Um, did, was it in the back of your mind when you were considering some of this, particularly for those who were in the bush and, and regional and rural areas that were missing out from what the city uh, folk were enjoying? Yes, I think that's right. I mean, we didn't have any impact on third world countries, but uh, my uncle ran a farm up near Wangaratta, uh, and I used to go up there quite a bit. So I had some passing uh, involvement with regional and rural, but one of the great virtues of being a federal politician is you travel the country extensively. And for example, I used to go out to a lot of remote Aboriginal communities because I was Minister for the Arts and we were able to build up about the only employment opportunity for many of them. So I think it became quite a crusade and, and that's where Bozzy and I worked closely together. Um, he said at one stage that when he came to the parliament, he thought all Liberals were complete ratbags and he did, he vowed never to speak to them. And yet uh, by the end of it all, we were sort of holding hands. And on my valediction, he got up and he said, well, I confer the, the ultimate uh, accolade. He said, you are now an honorary net. <laughs> <laughs> and that was, that was because of all the things we'd done for the bush. And I think mm. it, it, it was long overdue. I mean, they had been forced to accept second rate services since forever. And all of a sudden, sometimes only by satellite, but they were getting things that the rest of the world took for granted. And, and was there a time, though, in politics where you just thought that it, it wasn't able to fix, not that it should fix everything, or government can't fix everything, but was there ever a point where you were just so frustrated that things were being held up and that no matter what you were trying, uh, you, you were just ending up banging your head against the wall? Well, I wouldn't put it in quite such extreme terms, but um, when I decided to get out, it was partly on the basis that um, the, the IT bubble had burst in April 2000, so no more Silicon Valley. We no longer had a majority in the Senate, so we were unlikely to finalise the sale of Telstra. And um, I just thought, well, you know, you can keep doing this sort of thing, but I'd rather move on and do something else that, that was stimulating. But it was a wonderful opportunity. I mean, I can't imagine how lucky I was to have that. Most people would kill their grandmothers to get any portfolio in the cabinet. And here, here was me, you know, with, I was a one trick pony. I had this for. <laughs> Yeah. Well, it's nearly. And, and also, does that actually support, uh, there's some research that shows that the ministerial apprenticeships are, are shortening uh, the time that people spend in parliament before they be they are made ministers. And Dr. Maria Maley, a member of our advisory board, uh, has produced this. Um, do, do you think there is substance in someone spending time as a shadow minister for you know, a good year or two years um, to, to get their head around the issues should they actually step up the next day? Well, they can't control whether you're in government or opposition when they come into the parliament, but there's no doubt in my mind that uh, experience at any level, and particularly for prime ministers, I think both Howard and Keating were in parliament for something like 25 years before they took the top job. Experience is enormously important. What I discovered in this portfolio was that because it's quite technical, um, and I had a sort of you know, head start because I'd studied a bit about Telstra, but even guys like Stephen Smith and Lindsay Tanner, who are pretty smart operators, mm. I think just took the view that they were passing through. They weren't wanting to hang around here and get their heads around something that was going to be very difficult and yet utterly irrelevant to their higher ambitions. So to me, uh, that was always a, a huge advantage that I actually loved every minute of it. I read voraciously and um, I think that's helped me to get through. And I suppose just if we could explore a little bit of looking, uh, we, this is obviously a retrospective, but if you were the minister today, what are some of the challenges do you think that the communications sector is facing obviously we're talking about 5g but you've also got you have responsibility for the abc and that's you talk about that in your book so what are some of the the issues that you would be facing today and what how you would tackle some of them well i was just reading something this morning about 6g which is going to be the new defining battle between the us and china um look i think how to how to 
sort of ensure that high quality media is still available to the average person is a crucial issue. It looks as though from the way that Google and Co carry on, that half the population only get their information from things like Facebook. Now, that's not very good quality stuff. And uh, if the media are going backwards financially, it's very hard to make a living, let alone employ decent journalists. I think we do have some quality people around, but to me, that's one of the biggest worries. I don't know how you, you rectify it in the short term, but there's gotta be some support systems put in place. The ABC is unique. I mean, it gets over a billion dollars. It doesn't have to worry about where the next dollar's coming from. No one ever really gets the sack unless they overspend and they have to do something about it. And um, to me, there's an imbalance in the whole system, really. Um, but look, tackling new technologies, it's just at warp speed nowadays, and um, you've got to adjust all that. I think what, and I think Paul Fletcher's doing a good job on this because he, he was on my staff for a number of years and, and he's a very smart guy. I mean, he knew a lot more about some of these things than I did. And he's trying to replicate the, the regulatory regimes uh, in the digital world uh, alongside the, the real world. And I think that's a long overdue thing. I remember in my time, I'd say, well, we've got to have some restrictions to ban pedophile lists and bomb recipes and things. And, the usual reaction from the internet crowd was, how dare you? you know, leave us all alone, this is going well, thank you very much. Well, that's no longer the view, I'm sure, on either side of politics. And um, it just shows you've got to keep up with things. And um, I think there's still a huge number of challenges in that portfolio. It's, it's still a powerhouse and it, it was nothing when, when I first got there. I, it was, I was the lowest ranking portfolio when I first got there. Right. Well, can I just say that you are actually a superstar because we have someone who has actually um, joined us from Pakistan, <laughs> um, and that is Paul Linwell, a uh, productivity uh, commissioner. And Paul's asking, is there something about Telstra compared with Qantas and the Commonwealth Bank that made it so much more difficult for privatisation? Did the Hawke-Keating governments ever signal an intention to privatise Telstra? Well, Paul Keating was desperate to privatise it, but the unions had so much influence over the, probably the majority of their politicians because they usually selected them, and Kim Beasley was their representative, and he actually rolled Keating in. This is what I found extraordinary. Keating, in the lead up to the 96 election, was saying things like, I want to sell off. Uh, mobiles, I want to sell off the yellow pages, all sorts of things, but I'll keep the core network because that's what the unions wanted. And But his party policy was actually not to privatise any part of Telstra. So we just had this implacable opposition from the outset. And uh, I think it, Labor knew in their heart of hearts that privatisation was the way to go, and Keating certainly did. But I suspect they probably wanted to do it on their watch and then they'd have access to all those amazing rivers of telecoms gold um, and they could, you know, make it work. So they had multiple reasons for opposing, but as you say, they, they privatised a lot of stuff in their time. I forget probably about 15 government business enterprises were privatised by Labor, but this one was never under consideration except by Keating. And he was doing that to to his party's detriment. Mm. All right. Well, look, um, we can't thank you enough for participating today, and we very much look forward to your chapter contribution in the coming months. And um, I'm sure that uh, the members of the National Party who have tuned in appreciate the acknowledgement that you have given them in being constructive partners in your portfolio areas. So uh, thank you for that. But before you do leave, um, there is one further question from, I think it's an Eddie Maguire, wanting to know where you think they'll finish this year. <laughs> well, look, I did talk to him a couple of weeks back, but we didn't uh, go there. <laughs> I, I'm a pessimist, I'm afraid. <laughs> uh, right, so they, bottom eight then. <laughs> well, they, they won one, they didn't win a flag for 32 years, and I think they were in eight grand finals in that time. And uh, 
you know, that if you look back, they've got a fabulous record. They won a premiership every three years for about the first 40, and they've won about three of three the last 50. So, um, no, Andrew, don't, don't torture me anymore. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I suppose you did have sport in your portfolio as well. So uh, no, I didn't. He oh, did. didn't. Oh. I did. Kemp was right. junior minister of the arts and sport, and we called him uh. minister. He was the minister for having fun. Right. And I did all the heavy lifting. All the, all the policy work. Yeah. There's no credit for it. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you're getting credit today. So thank you very much. And we look forward to speaking with you soon. Sure. Thanks again, Andrew. Thank you.